in an immense universe stretching through the vastness of space is our nearest neighbor, the moon. Man has actually walked on its dry, dusty face. We now know with certainty that it is barren, desolate, devoid of even the simplest forms of life. The planet Earth, our home, a sphere of striking beauty. What a colorful contrast, green, fresh, fertile, and teeming with life in great profusion. dazzling diversity of life. What makes the difference between the lifeless moon and the living Earth? There's nothing else quite like water in the entire universe. In a surprising variety of ways, the peculiar properties of water seem to have been designed expressly to make the world hospitable to life. And the Earth has a great abundance of water. It covers about 70% of the Earth's surface. That's an estimated 326 million cubic miles of water. If the surface of the Earth were perfectly smooth, the waters of the oceans would cover the Earth uniformly to a depth of between eight and 9,000 feet. However, only a fraction of 1% of all the water of Earth can be called fresh water, or water suitable for our personal use. Most of us tend to regard this remarkable substance as ordinary. But we must not take it for granted, for in reality, it is the most extraordinary substance in the universe, and one upon which we are totally dependent for life. Just a glass of ordinary water, how much would you say it is worth? Actually, it's priceless. It takes 300 gallons of water to produce one loaf of bread. 700 gallons to refine a single barrel of petroleum. 4,000 gallons to provide one pound of beef. 
10,000 gallons to build one automobile. Perhaps it's time we allowed ourselves to appreciate what water really is. Almost everyone knows the symbol for water, H2O. Two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Rather short as chemical formulas go, but that's water. Now, hydrogen itself is a gas and very common. It also happens to be the lightest of all elements and was used to inflate the Hindenburg and other lighter than aircraft. But hydrogen is not only very common and very light, it is also very flammable. Oxygen also is a part of water, and it too is a gas. Oxygen readily supports combustion. In the presence of pure oxygen, even steel will burn. And so will the inside of a space capsule, and with what tragic results. Now think of it. Two gases, hydrogen, which is highly combustible, and oxygen, which supports combustion. When combined in precisely the right proportion, form water, man's chief agent for putting out fires. Here's another thing about water on which we depend daily perhaps without realizing just how unusual it is or why it happens. When you heat water to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, it ceases to be a liquid and becomes a gas. When you cool water to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it freezes. Why water reacts precisely as it does can be understood only by examining the structure of the water molecule itself. Do you have any idea how small a molecule of water is? In just one ounce of water, there are a trillion, trillion molecules. A water molecule is only one eighteen billionth of an inch in diameter. Human eyes have never seen anything that small. But we do know something about how the molecule behaves why it seems to be different from the molecules of other substances. The molecule itself looks something like the head of a mouse. The parts that look like the ears of the mouse represent two hydrogen atoms. The larger part represents an oxygen atom. Hydrogen and oxygen, two elements quick to join each other and once together, difficult to separate. The reason? there's a strong electrical attraction between them. The hydrogen atoms in the molecule are at an angle of 105 degrees to each other. As a result of this, there is an unequal distribution of electrical charges within the water molecule. The hydrogen atoms become positively charged, the oxygen atom negatively charged, and the molecule itself becomes dipolar, it has two poles like a magnet. Because of the shape the molecule forms, scientists sometimes refer to it as the lopsided molecule. This configuration accounts for many of its unusual and unique properties. When this much sugar is poured into this much water, it would seem reasonable to assume that the water would overflow. But actually, because water is a most remarkable solvent, the sugar disappears without significantly affecting the level of the water. Given enough time, water will dissolve almost any other substance, for it comes closer than any other liquid to being a universal solvent. It is this ability to dissolve that plays an important part in erosion.
As water erodes, it picks up chemicals and minerals. Were it not for the ability of water to dissolve or break down the molecular structure of other substances, plants would not get the nutrients they need. Force in motion is another factor dramatically evident in its power to erode. Its relentless motion through continuing centuries has helped to shape Earth's surface in rugged artistry. Cutting and chiseling through solid rock, water has sculptured deep, twisted canyons of spectacular grandeur. Have you ever wondered why water forms into a drop, a bead, how it holds itself together? Again, the explanation is found in the molecule. Once formed, water molecules join to each other in a sort of liquid latticework. The negative side of one molecule is attracted or joined to the positive side of another. In the liquid state, these attractions, or bonds, are formed and broken at random. At the surface where the liquid stops, the surface molecules cling to the ones below and to the sides. This cohesion is what is called surface tension. It creates a kind of skin that holds the water together. A drop of water takes the shape of a sphere. The skin holds the sphere together. A water strider walks on water. The skin provides a surface. A steel plate actually floats on water. The skin holds it up. Water skin is also illustrated in the old saying, like water off a duck's back. It is surface tension which causes water to bead and roll off the bird's back. Actually, Due to surface tension, these coots are sealed in an envelope of air as they die. But perhaps the greatest work of water's surface tension in supporting life is cohesion, or capillarity. Capillarity is the force that causes water to rise in a constricted space. The greater the constriction, the greater the rise. To further illustrate this principle, the stem of a white carnation is split and placed in containers of colored water. Through time-lapse photography, we see what happens. As water goes up the trunks of trees, capillary action is again at work. Without the ability of water to creep upward against the pull of gravity, the chemicals and minerals needed by plants to manufacture food would remain in the ground. Cohesion or capillarity is a phenomenon of water necessary to sustain life on Earth. In its solid state, water exhibits another phenomenon essential to life. In the days when the milkman delivered his product in a glass bottle, what happened when the milk was left outside and the temperature was below freezing? Again, the time-lapse camera speeds up the process. 
but actually this is what takes place only over a longer period. Milk is 87% water. It is the water in the milk that is frozen and expanded. Almost any other substance, like this melted paraffin, whether solid, liquid, or gas, will shrink in volume as its temperature goes down. As it shrinks, it becomes more dense. Water also shrinks during most of the temperature drop toward the freezing point. But below 40 degrees, something amazingly different happens. It expands and gets less dense. As it freezes into a solid, it becomes still less dense until it has finally gained about 9% in volume. This cast iron container filled with plain water, H2O, is placed in a beaker containing liquid nitrogen to cause the water inside to freeze quickly. As water expands and freezes, it releases tremendous energy. Fast, wasn't it? Let's see it again in slow motion. As you can observe, enormous energy was involved as the water froze and expanded. So why does ice float? Because ice occupies more space than liquid water without weighing anymore. Since ice floats on the surface, it acts as a layer of insulation, which protects the water beneath from further freezing. Now, if water, like other liquids, were to become more dense when frozen, ice would sink, and more ice would be formed at the surface. In the wintertime, the rivers and streams would freeze and stop flowing lakes would freeze solid. And even the oceans might eventually become a solid mass of ice. In the summer, the sun's heat would melt only a thin layer on the surface, forming a shallow slush. Life would have little chance for survival. But God created the Earth so that it might sustain life. Therefore, the molecule of water had to be different from the molecule of all other substances. With the warmer temperatures of spring, ice readily melts. The melting liquid flows from higher elevations to lower elevations, forming bodies of water. There, water vapor is lifted up by the heat of the sun. And the water, the sun, the air, and the force of gravity work together as they have for centuries, to keep the hydrologic or water cycle going. Warm, wet air is lighter than cold, dry air, which causes it to rise. These clouds began as rising currents of warm air laden with moisture. Born by prevailing winds, the moist air cools as it rises higher and higher up steep mountain slopes and contracts as it cools, literally squeezing out most of the moisture as refreshing rain. Raindrops wash the air, absorbing carbon dioxide as they fall, returning it to the soil as carbonic acid, vital to plants, and providing pure, fresh water for animal and human life. 3,000 years before the principles involved were discovered by modern science, the Bible described the water cycle with amazing accuracy. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence they come, thither they return again. More energy is expended in the water cycle in one day than man has been able to generate throughout the course of history. This alone should make us stand in awe at the power of our God. God's power can also be seen in the conversion of salt water to fresh. Man has long sought for a simple, inexpensive way to remove salt from seawater. 
Survival kits such as this one employ solar still. They operate through a process of evaporation and condensation, a process that God has been utilizing for thousands of years. The process is referred to as desalination or desalting. These solar stills do successfully make the conversion, providing fresh drinking water from the undrinkable ocean. Huge plants have been developed for converting larger amounts, but so far the cost of converting enough for even one city is comparatively expensive. However, desalination could well become our prime source of fresh water. Yet from the very beginning, God has converted billions of tons of salt water to fresh every day. We've considered many different things about water and its unique properties. All the evidence indicates that water possesses precise properties that make life possible. These properties were not acquired through a process of random change, but were designed into water from the very beginning by the master designer, by God himself. What does all this mean to you personally? Think again of how much we use water. Every day we use it in hundreds of ways. In a very personal way, water means a great deal. Really, it's a matter of life and death. 70% of the average human body is water. You are constantly losing this precious body liquid, and if it's not replaced, and fairly soon, you will die. It's the water in your blood that carries it through 60,000 miles of arteries, veins, and branching capillaries. Water plays a major role in the digestion of your food. It serves to lubricate your joints. Your mucous membranes would dry up without it. Without water, your eyes would cease to function. Water regulates your body heat. Right at this moment, as from the beginning of time, water is supporting life on Earth, your life. Water, with its precise properties, is God's loving provision for our physical lives. As we have seen, its formula is simple, but it is also very special, very exact. Man did not create water and cannot change the formula, but he is absolutely dependent on it. Water has no man-made substitute. Where the waters run, there is life. Where they do not, there is desolation and death. But this book, the Bible, the Word of God, speaks of another kind of life, spiritual life, and reveals another kind of water, living water. The living water, or spiritual water, is the Lord Jesus Christ. To a lonely, misunderstood, and sinful woman long ago, Christ said, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink? You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
However, just as God's provision for man's physical life is precise, so his provision for man's spiritual life is precise. Just as man did not create physical water, so he cannot create spiritual water. Just as he cannot change the formula for the one, so he cannot change the formula for the other. Just as man will die physically without the one, so he will die spiritually without the other. But just as physical water is abundantly available to man, so the spiritual or living water is also. And the formula is simple. But the formula is also special, exact, and precise. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but through me. Man is confronted with an awesome alternative. He can receive the spiritual water and live, or he can reject it and die. But remember, just as physical water can be yours for the taking, yours for the drinking, so the spiritual water also can be yours for the asking, yours for the receiving, free, without cost. Christ's invitation given centuries ago still stands. If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, and from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. My friend, receive Christ now, and you can experience eternal life, and your spiritual thirst will be fully and finally satisfied. Thank you.